Um, all right, so let's say the uh, the bracha and we'll get started. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Elohim Asher Yisrael Torah. All right, we're ready to go. So uh, we last time we talked about Shamor Vuzachor in the uh, the Sabbath one. I think we can move on from there. Uh, let's take a look at what at the following couple of verses, which expand on the uh, the basic commandment. So in the uh, Deuteronomy text, we're looking at verse thirteen, and in the uh, in the Numbers uh, Exodus text text we're looking at verse nine. Um, Okay. And we're going to read through, uh, actually we're going to do a couple of verses here, getting through verse thir uh, 15 in the Deuteronomy text and verse 11 in the, um, the uh, Exodus text. So who would like to uh, volunteer to read? Anybody? I'll read. Okay, Kim, you're on. Pick either text, doesn't matter. <laughs> Exodus 20. Okay. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your guard, God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, or your cattle or the stranger who is within your settlements. And then Four. Deuteronomy. One more, oh. one more verse. Oh, sorry. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay. So we get one explanation so of what? Uh, of the meaning or the referent that the Sabbath has. What's, what is the, uh, the rationale for the Sabbath that we have here? That Maybe the we, Lord rested and so we should. Yes, and specifically, there, it's tied to the act of, of creation. creation. Yeah. Okay, so we have a, a little recitation, uh, a short form of what was created when and uh, that's the the the, uh, the unfolding of the um, the ex the uh, way in which the command for the Sabbath is explained. Back in verse nine, Sheshet Yamim Ta'avod Vasita Kom Lachtecha. The you shall work for six days. Uh, and and the, the word here is uh, melach techa. Melacha is a word which uh, it's the noun form of the word to work. Uh, but there are two words to work uh, that we encounter in the Torah. One is melacha, which we have here in the Exodus text. And you'll see we have a different word uh, which we're going to go into uh, in the uh, Deuteronomy text. So would somebody like to read the Deuteronomy text? I'll read. Okay, Remy. Okay. Six day, Deuteronomy 5, verse uh, 13. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your ox or your ass, or any of your cattle or the stranger in your settlement, so that your male and female slave may rest as you do. Okay, Continue. there's one more verse you have to read. Okay, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God freed you from there 
with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Okay, so this, there's no reference to creation here. Uh, it's, that is totally absent, but instead of a reference to creation, what's the justification for the Sabbath that's given here in Deuteronomy? Well, it's about gratitude that you were a slave and you've been freed and now. Right, so it goes back to the experience of the Israelites in Egypt, in Egypt. and the, the Exodus and all that sort of stuff. So um, I want to uh, start from, a, a little, back up a little bit before that. You'll notice that there's a different word used for work in the Deuteronomy uh, section. It's, uh, we don't have lachtecha, the, the word for work being there, lacha, um, but we have a different one instead. What, what do we have in the Deuteronomy text? We have, let's back up a little bit. Can you back up just a, a tad, Kim? Yeah. All right, we have Sheshet Yamin Ta'avod Vasita Kom Lachtecha. So we have um, Malach, uh, Malacha is here again, and Ta'avod. So um, what, what you have to kind of get is that Ta'avod to labor is not. It's not exactly the same as called, talking about malacha. What, what words do you know from the Torah that have to do with uh, the uh, ta'avod? The, the two lines seem identical with the exception of a colon at the end of, the, of Deuteronomy. Yeah, but there, we have here a little bit of a, what might be a confusion. The two word, different words that are both used to refer to work. In, we have ta'avod, you shall labor or you shall work and, and do your malacha. Now, why would we could have said a malacha avodah, which also means work, but we don't. What's the difference between the root evid or avodah in noun form? being labor or work, and malacha, which we have in, in the second part of the verse. Why wouldn't we use this, the noun that's available to us based on uh, the, the verb here? We, sh we could have sheshet yamim ta'avod vasita kol avodatecha, all of your labor. But something is different about Tavod and uh, Avoda. Okay, so any guesses? Uh, sir, oh. you know, they're almost the same yeah. uh, verse uh, in Exodus 10 and Deuteronomy 5 14. The word rest is not showing in Exodus, but Rest is very much there in Deuteronomy 14. Do I that? don't know Hebrew, so. Yeah, yeah, uh, this is, I know that this is a little bit of a stretch, but um, the Torah could be simpler here, but it adds uh, a second word whose root is different. And you have to kind of account for that. What, so what is the difference, I'm asking you, between Avodah and Malacha. Do you know um, any word that relates to Avodah? Same, same root. Well, doesn't love or something like that? No, no. Um, it's a creative guess, but not, <laughs> not, not correct. Oh, it's parent, a, isn't it? Avod? What? What parent. No, no. Avot means parent, doesn't it? No, 
you have it later on. If you not, who's not supposed to to labor? Your slave or your worker, or whatever. Right. Avoda is related to Evid, meaning slave or um, serf, perhaps. Um, Lacha doesn't ever refer to person. So, and Evid is a it has this section, this sense that it's related to a kind of person, a class of persons. Is that so, the stranger, Rabbi? Uh, no, it's not the stranger. Although it, uh, it could be a stranger, but we have a reference to that a little bit later. The the Eva is is um, could be an Israelite, could be a non-Israelite, but they have they are part of a class of laborers or servants or slaves, and uh, they their work is um, how should you put it? It's not um, it's not a descriptor a descriptor of what kind of work they do. It's the kind of person or the class of persons that they are. So in the uh, description of the command for the Sabbath, your, your avod, your, your worker, your slave is also not supposed to do work, not supposed to do any lacha. This is one of the uh, sort of expansive sections of the Torah. Everybody is supposed to observe this commandment to, to not work on the Sabbath, even if they're not Israelites, even if they are, they're, they're, they belong to a class of workers who have a special uh, or um, uh, distinctive status as laborers. Nobody works, not your son, not your daughter, and not the slave who lives with you, okay? Uh, now we'll get to this question, what the malacha is. Um, it could be avodah, which also would mean work, but it's not. Where do, where do, what word do you think, uh, do you remember that might have to do with malacha that sounds similar? Any guesses? King, Malach. Malach? Mm -hmm. Would be the king, right? Ah, that is a very well-informed but incorrect guess. That's, it, yeah, it, it, I, I'm, I'm batting zero for zero. I'm sorry, Stan. It, see, what's interesting is they're both very intelligent and educated guesses, but that's one of the reasons we're going over this because it can be very confusing dealing with Hebrew, which works on this root system. So um, the, the reason it's not melech, meaning king, it's got an ah. olive in there. Okay. Okay. So Rama. it's a different route. Yeah, Remy. I, I know you're asking us questions. Could it be what you are asking? Uh, the other people outside the uh, Jewish community, if they if they uh, took over the city state, those people that are un or under them, yeah, they are also required not to do any work. That's true. Everybody, whatever their class within Israelite society, is bound by this. Uh, stricture that there is no work to be done. But there are like people, that. there are people in their community who would do work, right? Like who would, who, like who would do work that needs to be done on those particular day, and then they would have them do that work. It's not uh, everyone. No, uh, I'm wrong. A loophole in the in the law that the rabbis exploit much later. 
Oh, okay. They, they create the, uh, the class of people who were sometimes called uh, in, in Yiddish, the Shabbos Goy. You know, so um, there are things that uh, needed to be done and you would ask the non-Jew to do it. Like, like turn on the burner or something. Yeah, actually you didn't ever ask. You would say the burner isn't on. That's right. You might notice that the burner is not on or that the, somebody has to identify the floor in, that we're going to in the elevator. You would just sort of point to it. <laughs> and okay. all of the shop is going. I'm glad to know that came later. It did come later. And, uh, and again, it, it doesn't have to do so much with... Um, the person, but um, a, a way of creating space for somebody who is not an Israelite, not a Jew, to be part of the community and be bound by the Sabbath rule, but in a way that kind of helps the community in a unique, unique sort of area. So I, uh, I think I've told the story where my dad had a linen store and his Orthodox cousin worked for him there and his cousin would would make sales but then he would hand the merchandise to my father to bring up the cash register well that's sure. very interesting because it's against jewish law to involve another jew in a way of circumventing the, the sabbath so that's why you have a non-jew to do it because they're not bound by the commandment you can't undermine the, the observance of the commandment by another, a fellow Jew. So uh, I'll tell them. No, I have a story. A fellow Jew cannot be your shop. <laughs> okay. um, uh, so I just wanted to uh, add a, a little story that was um, uh, told by uh, one of my mother's sisters uh, in when they were growing up in my grandfather's house. This is before the Holocaust, my grandfather. Uh, had many children, one of them my mother, and it was an Orthodox household, uh, not Hasidic, just Orthodox. And <clears throat> the Sabbath was kept uh, in the house, and my mother was a very avid reader, and uh, she uh, didn't care about, um, she didn't resonate with Judaism very much. And I think I may have even told the story before. So my, when my grandfather it's was saying, familiar so far. Yeah, okay. My grandfather was saying good night to all his children on Saturday, on yeah. the Sabbath. And when he came to my mother, uh, my mother was reading a book with a light turned on. Uh -huh. And my father, my grandfather was reported to say to my mother, I don't need to have a Shabbos goy in my house. I have one right here. Yeah. So was, it was, you know, it was a pejorative comment uh, chastising my mother for not having the respect of observing the Sabbath rules, laws in, in her father's house. It and was, my mother watched. didn't care. She went ahead and read anyway. But, you know, th that, that unfortunate sh Shabbos going, it, it meant... It, 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 I'm sure they, he didn't mean it as a disparaging comment, but it came out that way. Well, it was a little sarcastic. Yeah. And, uh, but it didn't necessarily uh, cut as deeply as you might think. Stan. Yeah, a couple of things um, I've heard about in Orthodox areas in New York uh, that one, that in high rise apartment buildings, they have a Shabbat setting where the elevators continuously move up and down and stop at every floor. Right. And that also there is a debate about um, if you want to take a bus and you're the only one at the bus stop, you have to step back so the bus doesn't stop for you. But if there are other people there, then if the bus stops, you can get on the bus because the driver's not <laughs> driving for you. He's driving for the other people. Yeah. Well, these are things that we would we would say are I will put in the in the general category of kitchen halacha. All right, what I, halacha is the Yiddish way of pronouncing halacha, meaning work. Okay, 
uh, kitchen halacha, meaning it's not really halacha, but we kind of treat it that way because it's helpful. So for example, you're at the congregation and you're going to read Torah on let's say a Saturday morning. But there are only nine people eligible for the minyan. What do you do? You want you gotta read the Torah, right? So what do you do? Up in Amarillo, we counted the Torah as the 10th person. That's right. You count the Torah as one of the people and say, now you have the minyan, okay? Now, this is not completely nuts. It is just uh, an invention to, uh, to, be able to be able to read the Torah legitimately. And it's interesting with, that we would include the, the Torah scroll itself as as if it were a person who's a uh, part of the, what constitutes the community. And there are many, many ways in which we treat the Torah scroll itself as if it were a person. For example, when the Torah scroll becomes what's called pasul, meaning uh, uh, unusable, you know, it's uh, too much of the ink is flaked off or whatever, you don't just, you know, throw it out. You have to bury it, just like a person, and you have a full funeral service for it. Because in a way, it's kind of, kind of a person. It has, it has a status of not just being an object. Okay, and that's kind of what I'm getting at here. Malacha is the word that has to do with the labor that God does to create the world. It's a holy kind of labor. Um, Avoda, you know, you, you have a job and you go to your job and you do whatever you have to do at your job. That's Avoda. It's not Malacha. Malacha has to do with something that is sacred, something that is uh, connected to God in some significant way. So um, that's why that, that word is, is used and not Avoda, which would be uh, correct, um, would be correct in terms of uh, the translation, but it doesn't convey the same meaning as Malacha does. Now, I want to move forward with this. Could, uh, could I have one quick question? Sure, of course, Kirby. Is, uh, I need clarification. Is reading the Torah on the Sabbath considered work? Ah, no, it's study. Okay, so it's not work. And Judy, in your uh, story, uh, your mother's reading at night, was that considered work? Uh, you're, you're muted. Well, uh, what was uh, what my grandfather objected to was uh -huh. that she had the light on. Light on. Okay. And you're not supposed to uh, turn on a light or I turn see. on the radio. So it wasn't the idea that she was reading a book. It was that she was reading it to a light and she had no qualms of turning well, it on. really clear. I see. It's not using the light. It's turning the light on and on or off. I see. Okay. All right. So... Um, that would be the kind of thing we might have fire, right? the job is going for, okay? Um, I, I, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, in that verse that we read about do not do any labor, what if your oxen or ox or cow fell on a cliff on a Sabbath? Okay. What happens? All right, so are you, are you asking the question, can you move the ox? Yes, can you get the ox out just to save it or to okay. make sure uh, the ox is okay? That's a very, very good question, Remy. Um, the answer is a uh, qualified yes. First of all, it has to do with pikuach nefesh, the saving of a life. Now th that normally just applies to other people. But in the case of an animal who might be suffering because they've fallen or whatever the, the, the reason might be, you have the, the commandment of having to, um, uh, what, what I want to say, protect 
the uh, protect animals to save them from the suffering. Okay, so if you if the animal fell and was just you know uncomfortable or um, you know uh, couldn't do labor because they were in a bad physical situation, uh, you might wait until the end of the Sabbath. But if they were suffering in any way, then you would have to do what you need to do to relieve the suffering. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, so yes, if an animal is in the process of giving birth and needs assistance, you can do that? Yes. Yes, you can. It, but you see, it depends on what you have to do, what assistance you're required to do. If it's something that has to do with the actual birth itself, that's clear. If it is, if you are just relieving the suffering of the animal, that would be something that's eligible. <laughs> but it might not be anything that that dire. So it, it gets it gets to be a little bit com conflicting here. All right, here's the inevitable, inevitable interruption. I'm sorry. Be right back. Well, wouldn't you say there's really no, no time where you would never, I mean, no commandment that you would never break, depending on the circumstance, because well, it would conflict with another commandment or more? That is a very good question. And as you might guess, it depends on, it does depend on circumstances. You know, if you, if a uh, good example is, is Bukhach Nefesh, saving of a life. Um, I mean, you, you have to save a life. But what counts as saving a life? You know, it, it, it depends on how serious the, the uh, situation is. Uh, if we're dealing with relieving the suffering of the person, uh, that might or might not qualify. You know, it's depending upon what the injury is. So it, it might be something that can wait until the end of the Sabbath, uh, but it might not. You have to recognize that when you are dealing with these kinds of situations, these are all gray areas. And the, the law of the Sabbath is not It'd be easier, I suppose, if it was iron, if it was straightforward. You you always do it. But sometimes that's not the way it works. Let's say, for example, that your livelihood depends on your cow. And your cow is uh, in some uh, physical distress. Depending upon what that is, you might have to break the Sabbath in order to save the life of the cow. This is what's called real life. And it's, 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 it's not a straightforward kind of thing. There is a certain uh, realm of interpretation that comes into play. And this is what is so interesting about Jewish law, because you can't, it's not like um, the Napoleonic code, which gives you no real guidance on how to apply 
the law. The application is part of, the problem of application is part of the law itself. Um, you can say um, uh, murder is uh, forbidden. Okay, that's very interesting. And what counts as murder? Well, that's, that's also very interesting, but confusing. You know, you're walking along a street in New York and a, a mugger attacks you. Are you allowed to defend yourself even if that in order to defend yourself, you have to kill the mugger? The answer is yes. Have you just broken the commandment about murder? Well, not exactly. So um, it's very hard to find any kind of law like this that is so clear in all circumstances that there's no interpretation that's required. Uh, and you can't always depend on going to a court to get the interpretation. Sometimes in the moment, you have to make the interpretation yourself, which is why you study the law all the time because in the act of studying it, especially with another person, you learn the dialectic of how, how and under what circumstances you interpret the law. It's not, it's not left to, to be uh, kind of meaningless or inapplicable black and white uh, dictum. It's sort of like, um, in, um, I mean, all legal systems have this problem, but there are different ways to resolve it. In Jewish law, um, the, uh, the interpretive apparatus is really part of the law itself. And it's, it is the, uh, it's not a separate domain, like it is, let's say, in American law. And you don't have a separate institution necessarily to resolve these issues. You have to sometimes be able to resolve them yourself. Okay, so um, in one of these formulations, the Sabbath is linked to God's creation of the universe. What is it linked to in the, in the second? It's linked to the uh, exodus from Egypt by the Israelites. Now, can you, using your, your uh, individual or collective creativity, what is, uh, what, what is the connection between the creation of the world and the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt? How, are, how can one be sort of compatible or um, related to the other? Well, they both kind of uh, are connected with a promised land, but one is the big promised land, Earth, yes. and the other is, is, is a smaller one. Yes. Uh, so um, in what ways might the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt be compared to the creation of the world? Well, it's that um, uh, when you are uh, released, uh, be, when the Israelites were released uh, from slavery by being able to leave Egypt, they were sort of recreated. They were given an opportunity to uh, uh, redefine themselves, uh, to um, have a different sense of who they were and therefore, in a way, a kind of a, a being uh, recreated. Uh, yeah, that's a very, very, very good ex explanation. In a way, the Israelite people doesn't exist until it is liberated from Egypt. And I wanted to point that out. And I think Stan and Remy wanted to say something. Yeah, I see them. I'll get okay. them in a second. Um, the, you know, I've been doing this Muslim class on Fridays. This is very interesting here. To the, to the degree we're talking about our personal 
growth and so forth, we are becoming the people that we can and should be. But that, re that requires a kind of creative process. Even though we get born as human beings with all our faculties and all our potentials and so on and so forth, that doesn't mean it's the end of the process of creation for us as individuals or any for the Israelites as a people and so on and so forth. Uh, creation is an ongoing process and it exists on a number of different levels at the same time. So let me call upon Stan and then Remy. Remy was first. Okay, okay. Um, uh, I see in Exodus, the creation story. Yes. And the, uh, and the in, in Deuteronomy is the Exodus part. And I'm thinking about, I don't have the text in front of me when God created the earth, the humans and everything, but it just seemed like the, the hands, his mighty hand in Exodus is involved. And also is, like you said, he's building a relationship with the Jewish Israelites people. Yeah. He is also giving them instruction. Yes. Or giving them commands, what he expects of them. I'm right. not in... Uh, in, in in the creation story, you know, from what I remember, he took something and he used his hand. That's, is there? I'm, I didn't understand what you just said, Remy, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, in the creation story, I, I don't have the text in front of, did God use his hand with dirt, with the... Uh, well, he shaped, yeah, there's the shaping of the clay, you know, I mean. Yeah. So that would be part of it. Yeah, I mean, there... Um, creation is, um, well, there's a lot of different ways to go with this, but um, the interesting point here, it seems to me, and it's, it's embedded in this text, is that there is a sense in which there is a creation in which the work is done at a certain point, and there's nothing left to do. But there is a sense in which the creation has to be fulfilled. The work of the creation has to continue because its, its growth and development is a working out of the process of creation. It's part of what creation means. So it's not, a, it's not ultimately a static process. And that applies to us as human beings and to all sorts of groups and and uh, institutions and so forth. I see Stan's hand. Yeah, I. You asked, as I recall, what were the similarities? I think in both cases here, the justification is because of something God performed, something God did. Right. Uh, obviously, as as Remy was talking about, God created the world for us. And that's where we got the seventh day as rest. But in even in uh, the Exodus, uh, the, the tail end there says, uh, um, um, where is it? Just a second. That uh, uh, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God freed you from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it's, but, and then that ties into what you were talking about, Remy, in terms of hands also. But these, these are both, one of them is almost straightforward, at least to my point of view, the, the, uh, the one in terms of six days, the uh, usual work because creation. But the other one is, look, God, this did this for you, made you free, and you're keeping the Sabbath to honor what God has done for you. Yeah, that, that's, it's an, a question of honor, but it's, it's, what, uh, it's one of my favorite words in English, instantiation. It's where 
the idea is appears in an actual an actual uh, endeavor or in an actual uh, physical or practical sort of way. So for example, you might say, and this is an interesting question these days, that the, the, the American flag is the instantiation of American values. Um, the question about the Sabbath is that you have to act it out. You know, you can't, you can't um, it's not enough for it to mean something. Its meaning has to be um, embedded in how you behave. Now, in, in this context, uh, I want to share with you um, a definition, uh, or I guess it's a definition that um, one of my colleagues once came up with. Uh, how do you know whether or not you are enslaved? What what is constitutes slavery? And his answer was, it's not about the kind of work you do or who tells you what work to do, but who gets to decide when you work and when you don't. If you can decide when you work, then whatever the work might be, you are not enslaved. The power is with your is in your domain. For uh, I guess you, you might say that it depends on who's in control of time and the relationship between time and what it is that you are called upon to do. Well, this is why the the, the connection to slavery is part of the definition of the Sabbath. Yeah, Kim. All right. I just got the idea that there's a relationship between Egypt and the Garden of Eden. And then in okay. both How places, so? in both places, we're not free. We're the, the, the request is to be obedient to God, to do as you're told. And we really uh, become people as we leave both places. Uh, that's an interesting I. point. And there's a lot of a lot of value, a lot of truth to that. I mean, the it's the the culmination of the creation story, and the one that involves Adam and Eve, is what? How does the story end? Well, they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden, aren't they? Oh, and are they kicked out? Mm -hmm. Not, not exactly. They leave. Okay. And their re-entry is barred. There, there, there are two. Uh, uh, I don't know. We call them two beings that are set at the gate of the Garden of Eden that prevent the uh, enemy from returning to it. Hmm. So they are set, sent out into the world. And why are they sent out in the world? Into the world? Because they disobedient. Well, yeah, but what's the, what's the value? What's the meaning of leaving the Garden of Eden? Why is this not just you know, some kind of a cruel joke on God's part? It's one o'clock. Well, it's the point they become is human it, beings. Is yeah. it that they? What is the have... sign? Of having become human beings, well, that they, they will know die. Evil. They know good and they know evil. They lost their innocence in a way. They have, they have uh, sort of crossed a boundary to uh, when they had tasted the tree of knowledge. They realized that they were naked. They they could not abide by those rules anymore. It didn't fit them anymore. They went beyond that. So they they couldn't stay there anymore. OK. Um, I think Stan and Remy want to say something. <laughs> OK. So Remy, you go first. Stan, you're next. Yeah, uh, Sir, um, I am one. That, this is a question. I just read uh, the creation story. In the Hebrew word, in uh, 
the word commanded in yeah. Deuteronomy, when he said he commanded, and also in the creation story, sometimes then God said, but there are some interpretation, God commanded there be light. Yeah. And, and in Deuteronomy, he commanded the people to observe the Sabbath. So what is the word used in Hebrew in both, in both texts? Are they the same word in Hebrew? The word command or said? The word command is the same. And uh, said, said implies command. You know, God, God says, this is how it will be. Well, that's not just a descriptive phrase. That is, um, a, a re, that is a kind of, of command. God says, let there be light. And there was. You know, this, the, the idea of, of uh, creation in, in one way of speaking has to do with God's speech. God, unlike you and I, although actually philosophically, this is not true. If God says something is so, it is so. Not because that he's, he says something or she or it says something and now there is some kind of process but it is a way of saying that God's speech is a part of creation itself. Uh, how can I explain this? Um, God says, um, you shall be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. A reality has been created. There is now a kind of um, example of what it means to be holy because God has said what it is. Now it, it, it's all of a sudden there's a standard or there is a, um, a, re a reality that exists that didn't exist before. You know, when, when we as human beings make certain kinds of statements, something has come into existence because of our words. Um, so speech is something more than just uh, empty words. There is a creative um, implication or reality that's connected to our speech, and certainly that's so with regard to regard to God. Um, so when God says, "Let there be light," there is there is light, not because God has magically uh, created something called light. That didn't exist before, but because God God says, let there be light, it's already happened. It's, it's, it's not something that is a reaction of the universe to God's word, like it's some kind of magic incantation. But the reality has come into existence simply because God has said it. Certain certain words. Um, let, let's look at this in, from a very practical point of view. When you were a kid and you said something that was obnoxious or um, difficult or problematic in some way, you might say, okay, I take it back. But a lot of times you can't really take it back. It's been said, and now it's out there and it exists. And you can say you're sorry about it, but you can't take it back as, and undo it or uncreate it. 
it's now an, a, a um, there's a, there's something that's out there that exists simply because you've said it, and whatever regret you might have about it, or uh, meaning you might attach to it, subsequently is a separate issue. There, we say things, and they now have come into existence. That's in part of what. Uh, the concept of creation is is about God says let there be light and once God says let there be light light exists regardless of whatever else happens are, are you saying uh, this is very confusing and also very interesting but are, are you saying that uh, the light existed before God said let there be light well this is a wholly different question um, if if I say, um, if, if my, my spouse or my significant other, whatever, says um, to me, uh, you all, always do X, you are an Xer, okay? And I take offense. Can she take back saying that? No, because you can't. Why not? It's, it's it's in the air. It's been it's said. It's in the air. It's there. It's out there. It is. Even though they say that to the jury, disregard that comment. Well, you can, but we all know that the that the attorney says gives asks a question, which she then is going to withdraw. She going to withdraw, but it's been said. It's out there. It's in the mind of the jury. It exists. You can't take it back. Okay. There, understanding God says, let there be light is like that. God says, let there be light in some way. And we may talk about what way that might be. But in some way, light has come into existence. If for no, in no other way, but because the concept of light is now out there and it's in our minds, it's in the universe. Yeah, so, but there's also the issue of the naming of things, which was supposed to be something man did. Yes, Ad, Adam names the animals. Oh, just uh, the animals, I say. Yeah, but okay. it's an interesting question, but a different question. And we're okay. going to- We don't have to go there. We're going to, we're going to skirt that for the time okay. being. No, that's um, fine. So anyway, um, when God gives these commands about the Sabbath, they, I, I, can't, I can't remember now what the philosophical term for this. Um, it's something other kind of speech. Uh, um, let's think, for example, uh, about some documents that we all know and love, like the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. Uh, Constitution says, in order to form a more perfect union. Uh, that doesn't mean that the more perfect union now exists, but the idea of a union, a political institution, that is perfectible, that can exist. The idea of a of a union that is that that in a sense already has come into existence by the statement itself. Now we are working in the context where the idea that the way things are um, doesn't have to be the way things will be. A part of the meaning of the institution is this <clears throat> aspirational aspect that we expect there to be something different and better in the future. But that's already comes to exist because it's been said. You know, if the Constitution said, um, 
we expect everything is going to remain the same. And thank God it's not going to change. That would be a very different kind of document. But the Constitution is aspirational. It, and the concept of a perfectible government now exists. And because it exists, it changes our view of the government that we have and what our responsibility as citizens is as a part of this union. We, already, we now have a whole set of responsibilities that we have uh, taken on because this notion of a, perfect, of a perfectible government has come into existence. I don't know if that makes sense to everybody. But yeah. Yes, Rabbi. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think I am beginning to understand a little bit what you are. Uh, your comment when God said, there, 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 let there be light. There, there was already light. And then about the Sabbath. And the way I'm looking at it, the seventh day was already there. People already experienced ebbing the seventh day and light was all the, already there. But God calling the Israelite, the Sabbath, introducing the seventh day, you guys must be rest. We just put a new name, Sabbath, to rest and all the instruction not to do. And I feel like the same thing, let there be light yeah. there. There is already light, like you said, our union, that more perfect union, it's aspirational. It doesn't mean it already exists. It might exist and it might be existing in some parts of the country that some states have a more perfect union among the communities. Of course, perfect union really, it involves all the 50 states. Uh, that's the way I understand it, because this yeah. is the first time I heard this insight. And thank you for making me think about this. Let You're, very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. I'm glad it's meaningful to you. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I like about the way in which the concept of the Sabbath is presented in the Torah is that it's not a fate complete. It is not a static situation. It requires there to be change. It points towards a future which is greater than the current situation. The idea of the Sabbath is not to hold things static, but to recognize that to uh, fulfill the commandment for the Sabbath requires growth and change. So that's embedded in the concept of the Sabbath itself. So, um, you know, it, on the one hand, it is true that there, from another angle, the Sabbath is about a certain set of laws and customs and traditions that we have received from the past and that we have an obligation to live by. That is true. That's sort of the baseline. But that's not the end of the process. The end of the process is to, it's not something that we will achieve in our lifetimes, but it is to point towards a world in which um, some of the aspirations embedded in the values of the Sabbath become more and more fully realized. So uh, in that context, it's a progressive uh, concept. It involves change and growth, even at the same time as it holds on to a baseline of meaning. Now, this is like everything in Judaism, it's yes, and I mean, it's uh, <clears throat> Sabbath is about holding on to a certain baseline of concepts 
But that is not the end. That's just the starting point. The end is something that has not come into existence yet, although it has been pointed at. The, uh, the whole idea of a more perfect union, let's say, is not that the, the government and the society of the United States, as it is, if it were fully realized, already exists. No, but we can see it from here. It's like Sarah Palin said, I can see, I can see Russia from my kitchen window. <laughs> you, can, you can see where this is going. You can see what the direction is. You can see that steps are being taken, sometimes halting, sometimes very small, but moving us step by step towards a uh, fuller embodiment of the values of the Sabbath. That's ultimately why in order for there to be a Sabbath, it requires people who had been slaves, but have now been liberated, and are looking towards the future, asking the question, what is it that I'm being asked to do? So uh, the Sabbath doesn't come into existence all at once. You can imagine it could be. Where do we have an idea, uh, or do we see a description of the Sabbath as it exists fully? That's the Garden of Eden. And that's what we have to leave because our job as human beings is to create or recreate the Sabbath, but not just in the limited domain of the Garden of Eden, but globally. So we have to get out there. And when we leave the Garden of Eden, we have nothing because our job is to start from nothing and build the world as the Sabbath. Maybe that helps. I don't know. Maybe it gets confusing. Yes, well, I knew I knew that I was coming here. All right. So we have to stop here. But you can see that this notion of what the Sabbath is is a very important idea. And we're just sort of scratching the surface. Uh, okay. So we'll stop here for today. And Thank you all for, for coming and participating in your questions, which were great as usual. And uh, some of you I will see again tomorrow. If not, I'll see everybody uh, next Thursday. All right. Yeah. Can Thank I say something, much, sir. Rabbi? Thank you. <laughs> Have a good sure. week. Thank you. You're welcome, Rami. I, mean, I, don't, I don't mind if, uh, so uh, in high school, I was in a uh, discussion group at the University of Chicago Baptist Church. Okay. And this was a Baptist church that was so liberal it got kicked out of the Southern Baptist Convention. <laughs> okay. And I the one thing I can remember is the it was like the assistant minister and he uh -huh. said you you I think similar to what you're saying you believe in God if you've heard the idea of God. Well, you the God exists. <laughs> and I've always been curious that, about that. that. You, if the statement that God exists has come into your domain. Consciousness, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, so in some way, God already exists. But now, what you do about that, what the implications are of that, is another issue. But God's existence is not independent. Well, I, how do I put it? It's, it's dependent upon language. It's, it's dependent upon saying what the reality is. And now um, that reality has come into existence. Um, so, but we're gonna stop here because you already put up the sign that said 118. So I'm gonna take that very seriously. Good to see okay. everybody. See you next week. <laughs>